Hi folks, we're back in the studio. I hope all of you are well rested following your respective fellow weeks and that you're ready to digest another busy week of Six Nations action. I'm Ben Coles. He's Charlie Morgan. Colesy. He's Charles Richardson. Hello. How were your fellow weeks? What did you do, Charlie? Downtime. Hard downtime. Family time. Only rugby I watched was Celestino Ravutamada. Is that wow. his name? Is that how you pronounce his name? Um, carving for Fiji and Drury, even though they lost. But Ask Charles, he'll tell you. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the backstory to that is that Charles thought he was terrible during that <laughs> warm-up game between England and Fiji, and he carved up in that game as well. Well, he was terrible for the first 15 minutes, at which I was sort of doing play ratings, and I'd written, oh, God, this guy's rubbish, bloody, bloody, blah. Properly chucked him under the bus, and then he had a worldie. Mm. I mean, yeah, I was going to say in your in your defence, it was early, it was early doors in that game. Charles, what did you do? What I was on, the, I was on the beach in Spain. Of course you were. Well, I was on the beach in Spain. Whereabouts? Uh, Calpe, so Costa Blanca. It's all right for some, isn't it? Yeah, Why, mate? I was uh, eating lots of tapas, oh. firing back pictures of sad tapas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It did look, it no did look quite shop. good. It did look very nice. Charlie, you chatted to a rugby influencer last week. I did. How was it? I loved it. I loved it. His 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 video content um, made me uh, pine to play again, which doesn't happen very often. But he he really gets to the heart. Max Brown. This is he he really gets to the heart of why uh, the game's fantastic. Why more people should be um, involved with grassroots clubs. Um, he's brilliant. He. Um, it, rugby is in a bit of a vice and and, and feeling probably pretty um, neurotic about not engaging gen- generation z and he is doing a fantastic job of that um i can can reveal that within a few hours of that piece going live a, a premiership club um were contacting max brown to potentially get him in to to speak to their players about harnessing personalities on social media which is uh fascinating and, and fantastic as well that's very interesting did did you feel quite old i felt about 104 okay um, max is 22 he's 12 years younger than me but speaking a different I wouldn't say speaking a different language but just just aware of how the priorities have um, uh, how people consume content has has changed I wouldn't say what what was I guess the, the main thrust of the point I was making in the piece is that rugby's assets um, and what makes rugby so um, what makes us fall in love with rugby that is also making youngsters fall in love with rugby. It's just that when it is packaged, packaged maybe in a less apologetic way, which is what Max is doing. Charles, you're basically the youth movement on this podcast, so you, <laughs> so you you were you know you're all up to date on the on the trends and things like that. It's interesting, isn't it? I I, I really enjoyed it. It's a good kind of insight into an area that you don't know a lot about. Yeah, and uh, we've we've touched on this before. We touched on this with the Netflix stuff and with the Six Nations documentary about how. You know, I believe, and I think it's a viewpoint that is shared by people who 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 work with rugby day in day out. That rugby needs to do more at um, developing and showing off the things that do make it great, rather than trying to artificially create new qualities. It has sundry qualities as a sport. It's the reason why we all love it. It just needs to reconcile and find a way to to sort of advertise those in, and market those in, in, in the best way for a, a new generation and Gen Z got to be Gen Z surely is that on, not on you Telegraph. no I know I'm, I'm a millennial I believe oh man yeah I know I know so I'm only just fight I mean, I'm only late millennial wa- waving the flag for a late millennial that, a late millennial that yeah. sounds like an offshoot like genre of music which I'm not quite mastered yet mm. uh Fallow Weeks, second Fallow Week. I mean, Charles is obviously a massive fan because he's been swanning around in Spain. We we talked on this before, didn't we? It's going to get cut eventually. So for people who are saying it's lost momentum, I mean, careful what you wish for because at some point in a few years' time, we won't have this this Fallow Week. I think I think it should be I think it should be cut. I think it's the right thing. I think it has lost a bit of Agreed. momentum, especially off yeah. the back of that France Italy match, which was such a brilliant match that had everybody talking about yeah. it and was so dramatic. And had and, and and brought such fizz to the tournament, I think. And then it, that fizz has gone, and it's the, the champagne's a bit flat, or the or your respective sparkling wine of choice, whichever <laughs> European region that you're in. Um, but I think that it's a real error from the Premiership side to not have any rugby in the fallow week. There was nothing on except for in England. You could watch you could watch the URC, you could watch. Um, 
uh, the top 14. I watched last night, I watched um, La Rochelle batter Clemenceau Verne. Um, there's, there was Super Rugby, but I think there should have been Premiership fixtures. I know that they want, the, I know that they don't want clashes with the Six Nations, and I understand that. But it's a fallow week. There weren't Six Nations fixtures. They, I mean, at worst case, they should have had the Premiership Rugby Cup final um, last weekend. I was to be at the Sevens. Couldn't tell you the last time I watched Sevens, and and obviously it's been a while because I told you what channel it was on because I had to look for what channel mm. it was on. I, d- I didn't realise it was on TNT. So that that kind of shows. Shows where we are. Is it gonna is it gonna be this fallow week though? Or is it gonna be the first fallow week that they cut? As in are they gonna go three break two? Or are they gonna go two break three? I'm not sure. Three gonna... three break two feels more I don't know. Somebody I'd say, that makes I'd say sense. so you're limping to the end a little bit on that on that. But that's what that's why the World Cup is so coveted, right? Because you've got to go back to back to back and and have those mm. just have those that block of seven games and at the end of that you know a, a champion is crowned and I, and I just think yeah that uh, as as an aside with all of the narratives and how that stops with the two fallow weeks I just think it's a good idea we're going to be hearing from former England captain Will Carling a bit later in the podcast so let's um let's move on and dive into the section about England and just get an idea about what we can expect from them against Ireland this week Okay, so the latest England squad update on Sunday night was was kind of interesting. A minor detail was that Alex Mitchell and Marcus Smith are no longer rehabilitating their injuries. They're fully fit. They're fully available. Uh, Charlie, why why have you just put your your hands over your face? Oh, just because of he. I'm just deliver, Mitch- I'm delivering a squad update. Al- Alex you- Mitchell has defied initial prognosis on his. Uh, the injury we thought we report we thought and we reported I reported that it was going to be a longer layoff than that but it's a huge boost isn't it it's a medical marvel his medical marvel got very flexible knee ligaments never clearly. seen the like um but no he's um it's a big boost to have it, to have him back he was he come from as we know fourth choice seemingly before the world cup to make that position his own started the first couple of games he, he brings that zip around the ruck he brings that um accurate accurate distribution that so he whether he's playing for saints and and we've seen brief glimpses of it for england he really make he, he hammers um home that when when sides get quick ball he makes that look a lot better because he's he's so, super super fit um and he, and he just brings that brings that continuity the contrast to that was and it's probably quite tough to tough to to highlight this too much but danny danny care starting at murrayfield um Scotland got on top of that breakdown battle. They're really, really clever with how, with the timing of their counter rucks, how strong they were there. Grant Gilchrist had a blinder watching the game back. Rory Darge was fantastic in with his post tackle actions, just holding up carriers for a little bit longer, and that messed up the cadence of England's phase play. Um, and Danny Kerr had a really tough, tough day as a result. Um, so I think it's yeah, it's, it's it's a big, big boost to have Alex Mitchell back there. Charles, let's talk hypocrisy because we bang on about how England need cohesion. And they need, you know, to not chop and change and, and maybe kind of build a partnership. But actually, realistically, you, you could have Alex Mitchell and Marcus Smith at half back for the first time in this championship if both are fit. I mean, you know, it's another it's another change. But maybe this time it's the right one because they're, this is what they wanted to do all well, along, supposedly, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I would bring Alex Mitchell straight back in. I think just because he was sort of stuck, he did, you know, he ha- he has been Borthwick's. St- starting scrum half since the World Cup when fit I think I'd bring him straight back in especially as Danny Kerr seemingly struggled um, starting at Murrayfield the, the bench scrum half is the is the intriguing one do you, do you revert Danny Kerr back to back to replacement nine or do you have Ben Spencer coming back off the bench I'm not sure I, I mean I think he would revert back to, to Danny Kerr back on the bench I mean I think I would probably want to give Ben Spencer another run um, I don't think he did too much. There was that one grubber kick again at Murrayfield, but the, other than that, I don't think he really did too much wrong. Um, and then Marcus Smith surely is nothing more than the bench this weekend, is he? I mean, would he? He hasn't played in such a while, and would he chuck him straight back in? This is the debate, isn't it? Though, because because technically everybody assumes because it's Ireland that you're kind of on a hiding to nothing anyway. So what are you really losing about just going with the combination that you wanted in the first place and bringing them both back in? I, I don't necessarily... If if England... If if you thought that England were genuine title contenders and they were three from three and they'd, like, you know, romped to in the three games, then, then of course you wouldn't you wouldn't tinker with a winning formula mm. necessarily apart from bringing Mitchell back because he was the starter. Yeah. I, I kind of... I think, why not? 
Yeah, I, I, but I think by that logic, you might go with Finn Smith. Uh, well, Marcus yeah. Smith, who, who impressed so much off the bench. I mean, I know he missed that. Um, I know he missed that sort of relatively straightforward conversion and, and, and dropped that high ball, which were blots on his copybook. But other than that, he looked really, really sharp off the bench. Um, and he got one over Jack Crowley in, in, at Toman Park in the Heineken Cup with, with, with Northampton against Munster. And, you know, the, these are the little things that might matter. You know, Jack Crowley knows that he's been outplayed once by him a second time. Could it happen? I mean, I don't think it probably will, but I'm clutching at straws a little bit here. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I like it. I like it. <laughs> but, I mean, if, you, if you're going down the route of uh, we're on a hiding to nothing, um, so let's take a, bit of a, take a bit of a risk and roll the dice a bit, then I think I'd start Finn over Marcus, and I think I'd have Marcus coming off the bench. I'm looking at Charles Ollie saying that Jack Crowley's not going to care about that. I don't think he's on, he's on fire. I this whole um, discussion just highlights to me how much of a catch twenty two England's whole week is looking like. Um, selection's really really tough. Um, the one that the one that really accentuates it to me is George Furbank. Um, if he was brought in for the Scotland game because England had to score points, connect their back line, take opportunities against Scotland guess what? They're going to have to do that to get anywhere near mm. Ireland. And the last couple of times they've played Ireland, England have put them under pressure with, albeit having had guys sent off in, in all three games, I think the last three games they played Ireland, but in the two, last two Six Nations games, they've put Ireland under pressure with kick pressure, with set with a strong set piece, both scrum and line out, but there has still been an air of in- inevitability about how, how Ireland have pulled away from them at the end. And that says to me that they've got a They've got to keep trying to, as much as um, they are devoting time to the splits defence and getting that right as a foundation of their game, which is, I think, fair enough. They've also got to push the push the boat out a little bit as far as how they move the ball. And I think bringing in Furbank for one game, taking him away from the other, just looks muddled. And um, Steve Borthwick's calling card when he came in, came in was clarity, wasn't it? And I just think that would not um, that would jar. What's the what's the catch? The catch twenty two here is, I mean, what what would we prefer? What would England fans prefer? What would the, the management prefer? Is it genuinely start Marler and Cole again? Stewart comes back in, goes semi final against South Africa, try and eke out a, a narrow victory, kicking your goals. I think, or, pe- I think people would be, would prefer if England attacked and died uh, trying. Yeah, so but, lose by fourteen points but score three tries. Would would would, would that be? Preferable. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. Is, is winning everything in, in this game? I, I mean, what do you think aggregate scoreline of line breaks is in the last two Six Nations games between England and Ireland? W- would it shock me if it was more even than people think? Ireland will just use. Is it? Oh, it's is it miles? No, I was, was going to go the opposite. Is it miles? It was a landslide. It's is England, it ridiculous? England two. A two. Ireland eighteen. Oh my god. Yeah, and I was there in Dublin, so I don't know why that that staggers. That, that me. is two fourteen man, fourteen two fourteen player, man. Uh, defensive efforts. In fairness, but even so, still there. Yeah, I know, even so, because it actually, what I mean, what we have said before is, and I think we said it last week, was that England have always sort of up their game against Ireland in these past two. So the if we if we discount that World Cup warm up where it was, you know, where he, he was building, Steve Walthert was building for the tournament last year in the until Freddie Stewart's ridiculous red card in the Six Nations last year. England had Ireland rattled for a bit and even after Charlie Ewells was sent off in that game at Twickenham mm. it wasn't a foregone conclusion until maybe the 65th, 70th minute when they when England ran out of steam a bit. They did have them rattled and, and I just wonder, and, and they weren't sort of playing this all-court expansive rugby then and I do wonder whether they feel like they can get into, into Ireland at some of the, the sort of building blocks and the foundations a little bit because Ireland's Ireland are going to be more fluid. They have got more of a flourish. They have got more of a cherry and icing on the cake. Like we all know that. Maybe trying to stop that or trying to match that with a two-week preparation period could be folly. It, it might be. A, I don't know. Would, would you not prefer? I, I, is it, would England fans genuinely prefer a fourteen-point loss and scoring three beautiful tries, or would they prefer a eighteen-fifteen victory at Twickenham with six penalties? I mean, it's not great choice is it I, I mean it should really reference at this point a story from Dan Schofield in the Telegraph over the weekend about I- England's kind of lack of time on the attack and that one one England player only had one one England back sorry only had one touch during a training session we, we I think we said last week one of us said last week surely they're just focusing on 
the defense and the attack is going to come later because otherwise how do you explain it kind of thing and that and that kind of chimes to that a bit doesn't it at some point though it it, it needs to come doesn't it that's what that's but, what we but said then last I don't, week. I don't I I wonder if it'll even be I don't think it'll be until the summer or the autumn was my mm. kind of thinking so uh, Elliot Butlin friend of the pod got in touch with me to just to raise the point that we have this issue of timelines with with England and with Steve Borthwick in that they prioritized experience for the World Cup as, and saw the World Cup as this standalone event did really well at it but then our fans now thinking, well, Steve Borthwick has had a year with the, with the team, so they should be further along. Um, meanwhile, Steve Borthwick is viewing the post-World Cup as a separate entity whereby they've gone back to defence as a foundation and they're building everything from that. That is where friction is coming, in in my opinion. The odds, by the way, I've just had a, ch- had a look. England, 4-1. to 4-1 to one at home at Twickenham against Ireland. I mean, goodness me. I think that sums up the state of the two teams. It actually seems quite fair, doesn't it? And, and also maybe worth a tenner. I mean, I didn't... If you're willing to lose a tenner. I didn't say that. Charles Charles said that. Let's uh, let's separate. hear from Will Carling now and see what he thinks. Hello, everybody. Uh, apologies for the background noise from this chat coming up with Will Carling uh, in a restaurant in London today, but we discussed plenty about England... Jamie George's kind of role as a leader within the side when, when Carling was a mentor under Eddie Jones lots of topics about the modern game with physicality and eligibility and also what he makes of England's style of play hope you enjoy thank you for joining us on the Telegraph Rebel podcast Will Carling how are you? I'm very good you? I'm, I'm not so bad not so bad we're uh, nearing the end of the Six Nations who's winning it? come on then put you on, put you on the spot straight in there I'd love to say that we will somehow, um, I said we England, but Ireland are looking very, very, very impressive. So it's hard, it's hard to look past them, really. Uh, it's their consistency, isn't it? And the way they, they seem to have uh, very effective systems in place. Yeah, I, you know, they, they, um, they really understand how they're trying to attack, they really understand how they're defending, it's, it's impressive. And hey, that's a massive advantage when you've got 10 of them from, from one province, isn't it? Week in, week out, you're, um, you're able to play and train together. Um, so their understanding, I think, as a, as a group is exceptional. Can I ask you, uh, plenty of people to ask about, but, but with, with sort of England and Twitter, we, we talk a lot at the moment about so I'm talking about took a little atmosphere and a re regenerating that and I know they have gone to great pains to try and liven that up in the recent weeks. What do you sort of make of make of that, I guess? First and foremost, you, you know, you've got to win your games. You know, that's what people wanna watch and I think that that's the focus. Um but I think it's um and I think the crowd generally are smart enough to to watch. They want they want to see a team playing it and, and using its ability. I think and using you know, the potential that it has, rather than. I think the frustration of late has been that it's it's been quite a formatted, almost constricted game that you just get a sense that it's you know the players. Personally, I think the players have, have got more ability and potential than we're seeing at the moment. And I think that's the sense that you get the feeling in the crowd. That's what they feel as well. It's, it's almost like they're playing within a straight, you know, conf- they're being confined to play a certain way. And I think there's a frustration with that. Is, is that a, a developmental thing based on wearing and Dahl in their cycle? Or is there more on to it? Well, when we say where they are, um, you know, as in, you know, also what interests me when I when I hear quotes of, you know, we're a young team. Well, we're not actually. If, if you look at who's being selected, we're a very experienced. You know, you you've got the Mangalas, Coles, Danny Cares, George Fords. We've got a lot of very ex- old, experienced players. So I wouldn't say we're a young developing team. We've probably got quite a few young developing players on on the bench, but you know, there's a very there's a big difference between who's starting and and who's on the bench. So I don't think it's a development thing. I think it's just it's it's what this coaching team believes is is the way to win rugby matches. 
which is primarily primarily driven by what they see in, in, in data. You know, and for me, I, I, it's, it's, it's opinions, isn't it? My, my view in terms, I'm sure da- data gives you insights into, you know, games. But it's rather like, if you're looking at data in hindsight on games, you can be, you can be reading stuff into that. And actually, you can end up reading it in the wrong way. Whereas I think sport is about taking risks, it's about fulfilling potential, it's about the ability watching players do things that make you, you know, get up off your off your seat. You know, it's it's about certain times taking risks. There's space. You know, suddenly there's you know, it's over. You're in your 22. Well, let's go. Let's play. And and I think where the frustration at the moment is. I, I, I sense that England are very much having to play a format. Like, they're, they're in a data straitjacket, what I call it. Like, it's um, frustrating. I'm, I'm sure for players as, as, as well as fans, it's... Um, I might be biased. I, I think we have players with more potential than that, more ability than that. But, hey, do you know what? And the, the, the real truth is, it's so bloody easy when you're sitting in the stand. Yeah. You know, and and, and, I, and I'm very aware of that. You sit there and you go, oh, why don't we do... I was like, what, Christ, as long ago as when I was playing, we used to get criticised the whole time for, for being boring. It's funny, isn't it? And people now go, oh, Will, you're, it was great. And you're, you go, well, actually, we were, we were criticised for being boring in, in, in my day. But it's like... Uh, so things change and it's never going to be perfect. It would be remiss of me to not... Given we always seem to chat about England's midfield on a daily basis did maybe a weekly basis you, you and Jerry had so much time as a partnership together didn't you I mean how, how many games alongside each other it was me I mean in the late 40s probably yeah and whereas whereas obviously not necessarily through England's fault where there's a lot of because there were a lot of chopping and, and changing with combinations and partnerships do, do you sort of have an idea of what the right combo is, and the right balance is. Or... Well, I think I think that that's one of the arts of um, of of being the head coach or whatever. Is when I look back, Christ, all the way back when I started. You know what I think, Jeff Cook, and I've always said never gets anywhere near enough credit. Was he? He made a few crucial calls of. I need to make a call over Stuart Barnes or Rob Andrew. You know, it's like I need to make a few other key calls. As much as I can, I will keep combinations together and give them time. And and Clive did that, you know, and at test level, that split second is worth so much. And I think Eddie tinkered way too much towards the end of his time. And I think, sadly, yeah, we're, we're still suffering from that. And I think... Head coach has to have a look at it and go right. In essence, this is this is my front row, this is my back row, this is my you know, this is my midfield. It's sort of, and you've got to give them time. And, and there's a lot of change with England at the moment, and, and I think it's very hard to play Test rugby when you've played one, two, three games together. Yeah. Jerry, Jerry was lucky to have played alongside me as, as, as often as he did. He knows that. <laughs> <laughs> you worked as a, like a mentoring role during Eddie's time. Yeah. Can you sort of explain how, how that would work and, and what you would do? And... Um, so it was just it was just trying to um, help the sort of the leadership team have a think about how they wanted to lead, what sort of environment they wanted to create. What was important to them? Um, so would that be Owen Farrell? And J- yeah, Jamie no, to Jamie actually bizarrely, and I had a few arguments with with yeah. Eddie over it. Was never in the leadership team. Courtney was. Yeah. There was there was a variety of, of people. You know, Owen obviously was Courtney, but it, yeah, there was there was a bit of change. But um, I think it's so different in terms of age, their perspective on life, their, their life experience, because they from academies that they've just been in rugby. So they've never they're not really asked to lead, take on responsibility, you know, to um, 
to challenge, to think, to question um, at clubs. And there are not many clubs or coaches who who want to be challenged, um, question. You know, whereas for me, I think that's a basic element of of leadership and learning how to lead. And if if you are like Jamie, if you're made England captain, then you've got to think long and hard about what is why. Why did you say yes to Captain England? Why did you, did you say yes to being part of the leadership group? Because you want to try and help that group achieve their potential. And sometimes that means challenging coaches. That means challenging um, each other. And that's not a skill set that I, I think is encouraged much in academies or clubs or England even. Did you really get along with most things when you are in that role? Or, they, or is that just one, one example? Uh, yeah, I think he did. I mean, I think Eddie, Eddie's view, you know, was great. And yet, you always knew that his real belief was that fitness and functional playing roles he viewed get those right, and you win games, not leadership, environment, sense of family identity, purpose, now mate, you know. So I just like difference of opinion on what I think ultimately makes really makes a successful team. But hey, he, he was in charge. It, but I can see the value there of having you in that setup to sort of give him another yeah, viewpoint. Yeah. And we, we had a few um, stand up arguments it would be safe to say. So um yeah, but hey, that's, that's the way it should be. You obviously would have grown quite close to Owen during that time, and and not with, he's no longer England captain. He's, he's no longer in the in the squad. His move to France is now confirmed. I, I just wonder what you what you make of it all. I think it's very sad if, if that is the end of his England career. That that that's the way it finished. He is a very proud, passionate. England rugby player and 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 a very 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 good one and I know there was a lot of comment in in the media on social media you know and a lot of it is not complimentary and I think sadly it, my view on it a huge amount of that frustration that was aimed at him was was a frustration in in the way England were playing and and what they were what they were delivering on the pitch and that actually was not his call. Is there a perception thing there as well? When you were England captain, people have a perception of of I mean, don't they? Based on what they yeah what they're seeing. I think we all do. You know, it's weird. Like a, as a going a tangent, I you know I had a perception of and, and you'd think you'd learn um, having been on the receiving. I had a perception perception of Finn Russell okay. you know and I watched the first episode of um, Full Contact yes. and I'm like I like him yeah. which which was really hard to uh, to admit um, <laughs> <laughs> but I do he was a great character and I think that's the weird bit you, you, most people you see someone on a pitch performing doing what they're doing and that is very different from the person that they are and I think it's the same with, with Owen and the same with Owen, say, he's not someone who's going to talk freely in front of the media. He's not going to be relaxed at a press conference. He's not going to let you in and, and understand how he feels about family and just not the nature of the man. So, yeah, as you say, there's a perception of, of what he is, which is very different from what he is. And that that's a sadness, but that, that, is, that is sport. That's being in the public, aren't they? That is, that's part of it, and it's very, it, it is very hard to deal with. But if you hold your hand up, you've got to deal with it. With the, just thinking about Jamie, I think that everybody admires him a lot as a captain. Anyway, I think before Scotland's last week, given the loss of his his mum yeah. and how he sort of went through that, that would have only increased admiration for him. And I imagine that's the case with you as well. When you think about him as a leader and captain. Yeah, I, I think it was. It must have been incredibly hard for him, and it was very brave of him. I, I've, I've always, you know, as I said, 
I had quite a few arguments with um, with Eddie about getting him onto the leadership group is um, the biggest challenge I, I think for England at the moment is to be having the the honest uncomfortable conversations that you need to as a team when you're when you're trying to learn um, and trying to improve and and it's getting the balance of having those as well as building confidence you know I think Jamie is is very aware he's got great emotional in, intelligence and, and hopefully he'll be getting that balance right when Jeff Cook made you the captain when you were 22 England were, were in a period of kind of underachievement might be the lightest way to put it I don't necessarily know who the equivalent would have been in this squad, in, in this group, or who it might have been. Is that another way they, they could have gone? Obviously, Jamie's 33. It's unique. People go, oh, oh, well, wow, you were 22, and, and, and then you, things started to go really well. And I'm like, yeah. Bizarrely, you had characters like Dean Richards and... Um, and Winterbottom and, and Teague, uh, you know, um, experience like Rob Andrew. So uh, all you had to do as a youngster was actually get them talking and, and telling you what needed to change and happen. And in a way, I look at, I look at us, I look at England at the moment, of, have we got those experienced characters in the, Possibly not, you see, or, or maybe we have. And I think the difference generationally, the difference is that in my, they had the confidence to talk and to have opinions and, and they would challenge coaches because it was a very different sort of time. I think now you have the issue of money that actually playing for England makes a huge financial difference to players, right? OK, for us, it was our, it was a dream, but, but players had that, whether it was belief, confidence, um, that they, they would challenge debate with coaches argue with coaches I think it's it's huge hugely difficult um, and I haven't seen it within the way you create an environment where they feel confident enough to challenge and debate stuff without thinking it's going to affect selection and possibly you know money for them and I think that's something that you know is is just hugely understandable from the players point of view um, which is what you said recently about it perhaps potentially not being the pinnacle for some players I guess. well you know you sort of think it, it is a career now for a player right and, and hence playing for England is 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 a huge um, bonus financially in, in, in your career why would you jeopardise that by disagreeing with a coach but ultimately if you're coaching England if you're my view would be you want an environment where people can challenge and feel confident enough to challenge and you can listen and, and take on board thoughts and eventually, of course, you agree, you know, you still, you're in charge of the ultimate direction, but I, I think it's, 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 it's something that maybe England haven't cracked as well as they, they could have done in, in the time that, that, that I watched it. Well, thanks very much for your time. Pleasure. Okay, as for the other games this weekend, Charles, you are going to go from Twickenham on Saturday down to Cardiff on, on Sunday for a game which, l let's be honest, at the start of the tournament, I think we just thought France would win by 18 to 20 points and, and you'd have a nice easy afternoon. Now, Wales against France is a, is a fascinating game, isn't it? Because you don't really know, I can't believe I'm saying this, I don't really know who's going to win. No. I, the, France, um, France have an excellent record there under Galtier. Um, but they they do build it up as a sort of very difficult place to go. There is a, a sort of almost an England-Wales aspect to it or an England going to a Murrayfield aspect to it for France. They're aware of um, how romantic a, a, a rugby location it is with its prestige and its history and tradition, and, and, and they do really give it a lot of respect. Um, and they're going to need to... Gregory Aldry hopefully coming back, which is a massive boost for them. But then Jalibert is out. It looks like they're going to move Thomas Ramos to fly half, where he's deputised quite a lot this season with Toulouse. Um, and then they might start Leo Barre at fullback, the under-20 star who is uncapped. And it looks like they might bring in Emmanuel Mouaf Mayafu. 
as well, who is also in captain Huge. second row, who is gigantic. So they, we could we could be looking at a Pasolo Mayafu second row combination, given wow. that all three of their back rowers jump um, in the line out. As your scrum at, with we, with Weenie as well with Weenie on the tight end. Oh man! That I mean, that's just it's gargantuan, isn't it? What I would say is I do think this is about the first must win game of of, of Galtier's tenure. Like absolute out and out must win. I think if they lose in Cardiff, there's then a lot of pressure um, to, to beat England in Leon uh, when they're misfiring, frankly, and they certainly will have been misfiring if they lose in Cardiff. Um, and if they lose those two, then he could be in real, real bother. So I think this is about... I wouldn't say it's the biggest game of Galtier's tenure because they've obviously won a Grand Slam and they played the All Blacks in a World Cup opener and had a World Cup quarterfinal. But I think it's the first pressure-on, must-win game of his tenure where if he loses, then the p- people are going to be asking serious questions. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it was a Friday night game two years ago, wasn't it, it when was. France were going for the slam? And, and I'm just look, that Wales team, just looking at it now, um, is it, so different. I, I think it just shows kind of the regeneration project that they're going through. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, guy, Liam Williams, Alex Cuthbert, Jonathan Davies, Dan Bigger, Fala Tal Navidi, uh, uh, so many players that are gone from two years ago. I, I, from watching Wales in Dublin, th- there were things to like, particularly, as we said last week, Cam Winnett at fullback, um, Wayne Wright at number eight, Tommy Raphael was amazing. The defence <laughs> the defense was good in that it limited Ireland and then it, and then it kind of fell apart when Ireland found a way through it. This would be huge for Wales, wouldn't it, Charlie? If they if they could some if they could get a win here, because I, I don't really see they're sort of running. I mean, they've got that Italy game to finish off. If they could travel France and win, that'd be astonishing. Huge. I had a had a schedule um, really in contrast to how and and we're we're consumed by the um, obviously the, the stances on England because we cover it so closely. But the contrast is really interesting. Wales have lost three out of three. England have lost two. England have won two out of three. And the narrative that is building around those respective teams um, tournaments is is so different because of how Wales have partly by partly through circumstance have really lent into the revo- a revolutionary sort of sense. England have gone where it's going to be steadily, steadily, and therefore there's less patience um, because of them. And I think with Wales need certainly I think need one win um, over the next two. Uh, to to sort of justify how Warren Gatland has gone about this, but I was, I was speaking to, I did have I did have a very small amount of rugby chat this this weekend with an Ireland fan who was who was over, and he said, "Well, you know, after watching last week, well, it's going to be good by the World Cup," and he was and he was sort of steadfast in how in that sense of optimism. Now it's always kind of different when it's a a different um, nationality sort of looking in from the outside, and I'm sure Wales fans will still have their frustrations with how things are going. But yeah, absolutely. Win would be huge. Win would justify everything that's gone on. I think as far as as far as selection and wiping that slate clean. That's that's kind of it, isn't it? Though, as in, I, I like that. There's, I like the patience, and I like the fact that people are, are recognising that they might be good in four years' time because that, we are. You know, I know we don't like talking about cycles. We are at the start of a, a four-year cycle where actually, if you're going to experiment and, and give it a go, why not do it? Now? And and it's out of necessity as well. Yeah. As far as player pools as far as the kind of upheaval at regional level um, so there's that to factor in as well I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that Wales will play the better rugby in Cardiff I think um, I think France have looked really clunky and really inaccurate but I think France will win I think they'll have too much power I don't th- you like the, the Welsh front row struggled with the Irish scrum a lot from the off mm. Um, well, they, and, are, they are going to have too much power if Mayafu and well, Tuolangi and if it's Mayafu, Tuolangi and Antonio it could, be, it could be a proper demolition job up front uh, and I think France just might bully them in terms of in terms of the sort of power stakes and just limp to a, a narrow victory. But Wales will have played all the better rugby. I, I feel if it, I mean if if they can if they can get parity at the set piece and at the mall, France France's maulers look really good as well. Um, in attack, not maul D, but their attacking maulers look decent when they can actually win a line out. Um, if, if Wales can get parity at the set piece then I think they've got a chance but that's easier said than done really and there's there's only so much work you can do on that I think before it just becomes a, sh- a, sh- a sort of shootout between weight on you know mass it's just one gargantuan mass is heavier than another and that's it's physics. Sorry, I thought you were going to say something else there where you start saying sh- <laughs> and I got a bit excited. I was like, Charles, we can't say that on the pod. Um, just and related to that while I'm thinking of it, I, 
I think France could obviously give Wales a bit of a nightmare for clean ball at the breakdown, given the, the presence of those heavy forwards. But if they can get something, there's been sort of flashes from George North and, R- and Rio Dyer in particular that they can be lively. I'd love to see Wales kind of try and expand on those little moments that, that they had in Dublin and actually get a bit more, get Dyer in particular into chances or looping off his wing. I think he's such an exciting player. Yeah, that game suddenly, it's suddenly far more interesting than we thought it was going to be. Miafu. But that's, that's yeah. such an exciting. I can't, I can't remember that's too fun. many more exciting debutants and, and debutants where you would, you're just so assured that they're going to be a factor in a force and a force in, in Test rugby. And Leo Barre is a highlight machine, <laughs> right? Yeah. Lots of fun. Is that because of his his high placing in the uh, top 100? Miafu, yeah. Oh, well, we're we bigging up our own work, yes. working our own homework. Yeah, it's the I whole reason partly. we have a podcast is to big up our own work. I'd say partly, yeah. He also takes another box while I'm thinking about it in terms of a um, big piece last week on eligibility and, and how the effect on that in the modern game. And Miafu, Charles, you'll be able to tell me, could have qualified for Australia and, and New Zealand. And New Zealand. I believe. And he's ended up with France. And, yeah. uh, and I think actually France are very happy that he has done based on what we've seen from him at Toulouse. Should say as a bit of a disclaimer though that he, w- when I interviewed him he does now see himself as French, as an adopted Frenchman, as a French citizen. He has a French passport. He didn't. He, he went over to France to, to, start, to start again, to start his rugby journey again. Toulouse gave him a lifeline. And he he, w- he was not going over there as as a project player. That he, um, Mayafi's agent sent to lose a clip, and they thought, okay, we'll give you a trial. And he was he was a nobody at this point. Um, and I think Mayafi feels indebted to Toulouse and to the French rugby sort of um, arena to repay some of that faith. Yeah, yeah, that's a lovely story. Um, speaking of games, which are now suddenly more interesting than we. Thor, Italy against Scotland in in Rome. Uh, I will be there. I'm very intrigued to see whether Italy can build on that draw in Lille. And also, it's a great test for Scotland's composure, isn't it? I kind of think, you know, off the back of that England game, backing it up, this is the thing that we want to see from Scotland. We want to see consistency in performance. If they if they go out there and they, you know, score four tries and, and they're impressive in attack, I think that will kind of justify a lot of people's opinions about Scotland as a good team. It kind of reinforces that they're not flaky. And I think that is the word that currently they're trying to shake off, isn't it? What do you, what do you sort of I, see happening? I think if they limp, I think if they limp to, vict- to victory against Italy, then I think we can rule out a championship decider in, in, mm. in Dublin. I think if they've got serious, serious designs, if they've got grand designs on going to Dublin and upsetting the apple cart and potentially thwarting an Irish Grand Slam, I think they need to really put Italy to the sword. They need to be ruthless. They need to play very well. Um, just because they're going to need that confidence. It's a place where they haven't had... You know, When was the last time we, we, we mentioned this? When was the last time that Scotland last won in Dublin? It was yonks ago, but I can't remember oh, the exact... So, so long. Well, with, with that sort of record, you, you need wind in your sails. And I think if, they, if they're really troubled by, by Italy... This week, d- despite the strides that Italy have made, uh, I think if they're seriously troubled by Italy this weekend, and God forbid, don't even win, then I think they can rule, kiss goodbye any hopes of, of of lifting that title. There's that narrative of Scotland flattering to see, but also Italy as well. Like, how good would it be to see them build on that? Because they had such promising moments against England before um, sort of falling flat for the for the second second half of that game, and then carrying that sort of subdued. Um, mindset seemingly into the Ireland game and then it's great that they picked themselves up with that battling performance against France and it would be really really good if they continued that at home to Scotland and actually tr- and troubled them it's going to be it's one of those games that it's, it's a cool matchup isn't it it's it's likely to be uh, fast paced it's likely to be expansive um, let's hope it delivers yeah Scotland got five tries when they went to Rome two years ago um, Italy haven't actually beaten Scotland for, for quite a while 2015 Six Nations is the last time I, I think we think of it as quite a maybe more even than that but Scotland are actually on a bit of a tear against them I mean last last year the scoreline flattered Scotland I can't remember the exact final score but it certainly flattered Scotland because if you remember Italy were camped on the Scotland line it, with basically clocking almost in the red for they were there for sort of five minutes or so five metres out looking for the try to, to win 
and then they coughed up the ball and, and Scotland went the length, didn't they, to score a, a, a try and conversion to seal it. So it actually made it look like there was more than one score in it when there, when there really wasn't. And Italy pushed them really close last year. I don't think there was anything actually riding on that game, though, except for Italy avoiding the wooden spoon, I suppose. Um, whereas this year, you know, there is something really for Scotland. They obviously need to hope, help, uh, hope that England do them a favour at Twickenham. But if... If they went to if they, if they went to Dublin and won, they wouldn't even need a favour from. They might not even need a favour at Twickenham. It's, it's the classic coach speak game, isn't it? Don't take your eye off the ball and think about the game next week in Dublin. Go to Rome and get the job done. Particularly excited to see. Well, I think that's what I like about Scotland in general. Um, there's just players that now you actually want to see play. I don't expect Duane van der Merwe to get another hat trick, but, but I'm intrigued to see you know what he can do in, in Rome. And, and there's other Rory Darge. I think has actually had a very very good tournament when he's featured for Scotland as well. There's just a, a, a nice feeling around them as a side and, and sort of a sense that maybe maybe this is it. Maybe they are kind of legit, legit title contenders. It's going to be really interesting. Right, let's finish up and get into some of your questions. Okay, thank you as ever for your questions. Much appreciated. Always give us plenty to think about. We've got one to kick off from a friend of the podcast, Guillaume from Le Keep, who says... During the Rugby World Cup, Steve Borthwick taught Mark, thought Marcus Smith was not able to play fly half. Three months later, his opinion has changed. And so that's kind of referencing the way that England used Smith as a fullback and as a secondary playmaker. But Charlie, he's very much a, a fly half now, isn't he? We've got other fullbacks to quibble over with Furbank and Stewart. He's not going to come <laughs> yeah. back in at fullback, is he? Yeah, there's not enough room in the fullback um, debate. Um, a dear friend of the podcast, um, the. I a few things have changed, right? So, so Owen Farrell isn't there anymore for one, um, and I think the second major um, major factor might have been how how Marcus Smith started the the season for Harlequins. Lots of measured kicking in that, lots of control of territory as as well as bringing his what his USP is, which is that kind of dancing running threat. Um, he was set up. You know, a lot of people sort of quite close to the squad were telling us how disappointed they were after his calf injury because it felt like an opportune time for him to really kick on and make that 10 shirt his own and, and I know what George Ford brings there is that is that control is that experience and I think that has I think that will continue to be quite valuable now that he's started those three games um, I going right back to, our, the, to how we started this podcast I, I agree with Charles that I would be very surprised if Marcus Smith does now start, but I can see that those. I can see Marcus Smith and George Ford dovetailing quite nicely at ten and twenty-two, just given what um, how Marcus Smith can sort of um, spark a game. I think back to two games this season, just to just to slightly argue with you, Guillaume. Sorry, um, uh, Harlequins away at Racing and the big game at, at Twickenham against Gloucester, mainly mainly the one at um, uh, uh, Rassing away, where Marcus Smith played absolutely beautifully, and I thought that was a real um, sort of key moment in, in his development and maturity, whereby all of a sudden he was looking at putting others away in, in, in holes and creating space for others and not necessarily always having to sort of do everything himself. Um, he kicked brilliantly. I mean, he kicked a, a long-range drop goal, which is not, you know, it doesn't mean much, despite the fact that England have got a bit of a penchant for drop goals. It doesn't mean much, but it just it embodied and symbolised this sort of maturity and game management of of keeping the scoreboard ticking along and, and, and doing the right thing. And I was m really, really, really impressed with him at that day in um, in La Défense uh, uh, when Quinn's against all odds defeated Racing. Um, and I do think that he should be given a run. Um, but again, as we've said, and as Charlie's just said, when fit, should he be thrust straight back in? Uh, I, d I don't think so. I think I'd prefer to see Finn Smith right now this week in terms of the context of the tournament. I think I'd prefer to see Finn Smith start, but certainly for the tour to New Zealand, give Marcus the keys. So hang on, so you want Finn Smith to start? You want Ford to start? And I would like Marcus Smith to start. So this is why we're not Selectors. It's a Mexican standoff because we're, you know, no pun intended. We're all, we're all in our own, our own corners. Clarity and cohesion and <laughs> lacking. 
<laughs> well, that ties into our uh, it's like a Mark Leaveron sele- selection t- meeting. Ties it? into our <laughs> that's that's a great reference. Sorry, uh, also that drop goal. Uh, how long range are we talking? Like Fran Stain long range? No, or? not quite. I think it was I think it was forty three or forty five tops I had, and it was on an artificial surface indoors. So, but even so, it's a good strike. It wasn't as good as Finn Smith's at well, Town Park, was it? Yeah, no, it wasn't because that was an equal long dra- range in uh, what can only be described as biblical. So Rain. if you'd said that about Finn Smith, you'd have strengthened your Finn Smith argument if you'd, yeah. if you'd twisted we've, that. We've already mentioned it. Sorry. Okay. Um, next question from Elliot. Um, England's attack is a, is a burning hot topic on social media at the moment. And he says, if it's true that England are barely training the attack, as per the oh, Telegraph story, is it not a fundamental, fundamental question about Steve and his philosophy and his suitability as a head coach? I... I my opinion on this is is that England, at the moment, are a bit like a house that needs a lot of work. And you kind of need to just decide which bit you want to work on, first of all. And they've decided that they want to work on the defence first, it seems, based on everything we're hearing and, and certainly based on everything we're seeing when they actually get on the field. So I, I think you just have to... I know preaching patience is a fine line when you are spending a lot of money on tickets to go and watch England play. I can absolutely appreciate the frustration and errors like you saw at Murrayfield are inexcusable. But I, I kind of just think that they, they're pr- prioritising other things at the moment. And and it doesn't necessarily reflect on Wigglesworth as an attack coach because attack isn't the focus. Charlie, what do you think? I think that's really fair. And I think it is... It, I've I've said this previously... People are sick of hearing about the excuses, as you say. People are sick of hearing about um, coaches imploring that they get a bit of time. And I don't think Steve Borthwick is doing that particularly um, because he know because he knows that people are wary of it. But he, what he's had to pick up is just it's almost the three separate um, campaigns in isolation that he's had, and um, that's off the back of an Eddie Jones era that is still creating or certainly up to this season with the players that have left um, was still pre- Joe Marchant is the big one right he's, he's, he's he um, agreed to go because he was out of the picture with Eddie Jones so that's the that's the context there is, the context is really difficult for him and you're right they have to um, do this gradually just because of logistics and having the training time available to them it makes sense that with a new defence coach that is what they're going to want to prioritise straight away in areas of their game and I've written about this for for this morning, is a skill for, I think, a lot of facets of his coaching will be under the microscope this week, not just selection, but also how he, um, how he, how he instills confidence that areas of that Scotland performance were actually all right. They were good in the air. They were decent at the set piece. They scored a really nice first phase try. They've got to build on that um, and then also improve the areas that let them down, which was that just that tidiness around the breakdown and the, and the handling areas, which were horrible. Um, but yeah, you—they've got to prioritise something. As you're right, I think I think his track record suggests that it is worth keeping the faith as well. I mean, at Leicester, um, and I know sort of, um, you know, it, it's quite revisionist, but people people have sort of tarred them with a quite boring conservative brush. But if you go back and actually watch some of Leicester's big victories, it, it's not true. They attacked very well, but in the, in the 22, they were very ruthless. They were very direct, and they attacked very well in the sort of. In, in the opposition half when they smelt blood but it, it, it was the kick chase and there was lots of kicking and conservatis- conservatism that got them there in, with Leicester and they did kick a lot from deep they didn't they didn't take any risks in their own half they didn't play out of their own 22 no and there wasn't much counter attacking but once they got to the 22 um, Leicester attacked very very well and scored some very very tidy pretty tries um, and I think that will surely be his vision for how he wants England to attack. But at the minute, they are not good in the 22, and that's something that really needs to improve and something that he will be working on, is how they improve this, that clinical edge, that ruthlessness in the opposition 22, because England weren't good in the 22 under Eddie Jones, and they haven't been so good under Steve Borthwick either. And that's a real work on for them. But evidence suggests from his time at Leicester that, might and hopefully will for his sake come 
but it is it's not gonna it's not an overnight fix the the best i've seen this this termed and i'm really sorry i've, I've forgotten who, who actually said it but it was if you're an england fan tuning in and you're seeing elliot daly you're seeing george ford you're seeing um, joe marler dan cole jamie george henry slade these guys that are really experienced you can't, it's harder to forgive muddled performances mm. um, because of this and then in this this contrast with wales kind of wiping the slate clean comes comes to the forefront again you you if you're a wales fan you're forgiving you know that little bit of uncertainty and you actually haven't seen that much uncertainty from wales because they've looked really they've looked dogged and they've looked kind of quite quite dynamic even though they've gone down to these defeats so that's again part of this big messy catch 22 that steve Borthwick's facing and our final question from Chattering Reserve um, is, is almost a logistical question for The Telegraph, where he says, um, at least one of you will be in France on Super Saturday, so is anyone going to be at the Rugby Europe Championship Finals on the Sunday? Uh, logistically, we can't make it work because of various flights and travel, but that's going to be very good, isn't it, Charles, sort of having, them, having that kind of event on that day. There's so much interest in those teams now after the Rugby World Cup. Yeah, I mean, pre-tournament when we were looking at when we were looking at travel and itineraries and this and the other, I noticed that it was in Paris, and we did look at going. The issue was pre-tournament that we thought that it could be well. There's a ch- there was a chance it could have been a Grand Slam decider because we a lot of us had France as favourites and that gr- Grand Slam champions, and there was a chance that England might be going to Lyon to to thwart the Grand Slam or even. You know, in in our in the wildest dreams that England would would be going to. I was going to say to, to a, gr- a grand, grand slam, slam decider. Yeah. That France might win the grand slam. Yes, that France might win the grand slam. But even in the wildest yeah. dreams, there might have been that England were going to France for a grand slam of their own, and then Sunday becomes incredibly busy for us. Um, so no, we won't be there in person, but we will certainly be watching, and hopefully on that Monday morning podcast, which will be the last one of this series, we will have a short discussion about the victor um which yeah is shaping up to be a, a cracking game there's there's three finals that day it's sort of staged and we you know if you were a betting man you'd say that the that the big grand finale in the evening would be georgia against either portugal or spain yeah yeah fun no we'll definitely have a chat about it right that's it today thank you charlie thank you charles quick uh, quick predictions uh for the three games charles start with you Italy, Ireland, France. Italy, Ireland, France. Three one-score games. One-score games, lovely. Yeah. Scotland, Ireland, Wales. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm thinking the same. I agree with three one-score games as well. I think they'll all be close. Uh, for variety, I'll say Scotland, Ireland and France. Winner. You didn't want to say England for variety. No. Winner gets a pack of Werther's Originals next week or something. Yeah. Um, thank you Charlie thank you Charles thank you everybody for listening to the podcast for downloading it for subscribing loads of build up this week to the big games especially that England Ireland game at Twickenham could be an absolutely fascinating 80 minutes we'll all be back next week to review to look ahead to the final round of action in the Six Nations but for now goodbye <laughs>